Uh, well, my name is Brian Pogue. I run the seminar series here, and so I also happen to be speaking today. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to tell you about some, um, some big events that have happened at Thayer. Not technically at Thayer, but happened uh, as part of the Thayer School of Engineering. And that is the move and uh, the sort of uh, move into the Williamson Translational Research Building at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. And then an initiative we're starting called the Center for Imaging Medicine at Dartmouth. So I'd like to tell you about that, a little bit of history and um, what's going to happen going forward. So I, uh, you know, I've been here for almost 20 years and um, it's amazing how time has flied, but uh, you know, we have morphed into a situation now where the Thayer School of Engineering has a really massive uh, engineering and medicine research infrastructure. And I like to think of it in three bins. Uh, of course, if you ask any faculty member, these bins are different, uh, but these are my definition of the bins. There's biochemical, biological and chemical engineering, medical imaging and instrumentation, and biomaterials and mechanics. And uh, this is really dangerous to try to put faculty uh, into a bin because as soon as somebody does this to me, I say, no, no, you, you don't understand my research at all. Uh, but anyway, there's a whole bunch of names. By my count, uh, there's about 29 full-time faculty, about 19 adjunct faculty, and about 65 MS and PhD students. Um, it's 50% of our graduate program here at Thayer. $13 million of research, which is actually about 72% of the Thayer School research budget. So engineering medicine, you know, is the largest chunk of Thayer School by far. And so it's, uh, it's exciting to be part of that. Um, historically, you know, where has biomedical engineering been at the Thayer School? It's sort of literally at the back of the house. Uh, it's in the back uh, top floor of the Cummings Building, it's in the back of the Cummings Building, it's in the basement. Um, historically, that's where it's been. Um, biomedical engineering you know, didn't really exist here about 40 years ago, and uh, the, the um, uh, dean of the engineering school, John Strobane, kicked off much of what went on, uh, working with the Department of Surgery. Uh, then John Collier came along and brought in bone mechanics and uh, replacements and uh, really has done a phenomenal job. But John Strobane's lineage uh, trained many of our senior faculty, uh, Stu Trombley and Keith Paulson, most notably. I'm probably forgetting some. And then we've added in uh, uh, Tillman Gerngross, adding in the biotech sector in a pretty big way. And, and so, you know, if you look at the history of biomedical engineering or bioengineering at Thayer, it's been growing and growing and growing to now where we're 72% of the research funding at Thayer, uh, and clearly has outgrown the building. And so um, back in the early 90s, when, when I came, about mid-90s, uh, Jack Hoops had been collaborating with many of the faculty here and started the surgical research labs. And so a number of faculty uh, were invited to work with Jack Hoops and his laboratory and so that was really um, sort of infrastructure. We were given laboratory space in the surgical research labs. That was a, a, a footprint, really, at the Thayer, at the, uh, for Thayer School in the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Then in the mid-2000 era, uh, the Norris Cotton Cancer Center added four floors to its, uh, and that was all research floors. And so we were given, again, uh, some footprint space in the Norris Cotton Cancer Center. And so we grew again. Uh, and in just in this decade, um, we've purchased space in the Vail Research Building for the biological engineering folks. Uh, Keith Paulson has sort of single-handedly, as I would think, uh, created the Center for the Advanced Imaging Center and the Center for Surgical Innovation. Uh, and he gave a whole Jones seminar on this last year, so I won't uh, belabor it, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty impressive facility, if you haven't seen it, where um, there's two operating rooms with movable CT and MRI scanners on rails that come in and out of the uh, operating room, and it's 100% research, so all operations in there are on a research protocol, and uh, it's really operated largely by the Thayer School of Engineering 
although uh, owned and managed by the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. So that's been, uh, a, you know, again, a, a progression. And, and from my perspective, the reason I wanted to talk today was to introduce you to what's just happened, which is the Williamson Translational Research Building was uh, constructed this year and opened. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's right beside the main rotunda of the hospital as you walk in, and it's connected very seamlessly to the cancer center through bridges. Uh, and so it's this, the connectivity between the cancer center and the Borwell Research Building is really uh, fantastic. Um, I walk way through here, and uh, there's a large auditorium on the main floor as well. And Dave Harris, who's sitting right here, is the building you're like the building manager. Build well, and Dave Steiger was sitting right there. Right? Yeah, okay. So, terrific. Dave and Dave, uh, really. Uh, and, and I put here Ian Baker and Joe Helbley because they paid for it. They helped us pay for it. So they, Joe, uh, cough, I don't know if Joe's here, but he coughed up the money to fund it. And, and that's a substantial uh, investment. And, uh, but, you know, probably the most important thing to recognize is this isn't just space. It's open space and it's supposed to be reconfigurable space. And so uh, it's an open concept lab where many of the benches and, uh, not all of them, but many of the benches and cabinets are on wheels. So it can be reconfigured based on investigators' research agendas and what goes on. Uh, the Thayer School ex uh, owns half of the seventh floor, which is a substantial amount of space. It's 8,000 square feet. Oh, most of it is this open concept style lab with large windows. Um, so really uh, just a terrific work environment. And um, right now the investigators who have been given space in this are, are shown here. They're a pretty happy group of people uh, so far. We haven't gotten into tensions about space yet. Uh, but uh, we've already, I've already had one request from the hospital to have research space in there and I think we politely declined it. But uh, it's, you know, open space is open space. And so right now we have 10 investigators in there, maybe 11 investigators in there, uh, six offices, uh, open concept laboratory, two different kitchens, break rooms, reconfigurable spaces, things on wheels. So it's a great environment, just to show you a little closer up. Um, it's an open concept lab, break room, uh, meeting room, fits about 20 people, and then all different types of research that goes on. And so, you know, it's the place where we do a lot of instrumentation, a lot of preclinical imaging, uh, computer programming, tissue culture, contrast agent development, animal surgery, um, all kinds of things all mixed together. It's all uh, biosafety level two, so you can't drink a cup of coffee in there, but uh, you can do research. <laughs> that's, a, that's obviously a point of contention among engineers. So. <laughs> but there is a really nice kitchen. So. Um, so that's the space we've just moved into. And again, uh, it's, the exciting part is uh, this is all translational imaging where we can mix up that preclinical imaging, clinical imaging, uh, clinical development, and really most of us do instrumentation of imaging of some sort. So I, you know, I've been here again for 20 years, and we've been building what we call the optics and medicine uh, group. It's not really a research lab. It's uh, it's more like a socialist community of people, sort of like a Bernie Sanders style socialist community of people who just kind of collaborate together. It's not a single research group, it's actually multiple researchers who just you know, choose to associate with each other. And it's been exciting. Uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago it was just me and Keith Polson and a grad student, and uh, you know, now we're you know, uh, a lot of people, uh, and it's grown and continues to grow. And people come and go, but um, it's fed by a number of research grants. We, actually have about six million per year, which is one third of the funding at Thayer. Um, so it's a substantial research effort, collaborating with a number of companies. And you know, the reason I mention that is because this is the sort of thing that this space invites, is people to collaborate together, in particular, collaborating with medical uh, collaborators 
is, is facilitated there, you really can't do meaningful medical collaboration unless you go to the hospital and uh, you know, see what's going on, talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. And, and, and we can convince a handful of clinicians to come here, but it's much, much easier to do it the other way. So just to show you an example, uh, one long-term effort we've had is in this area of molecular guided surgery. And uh, so this idea that we uh, would like to advance surgery based on molecules and tissue rather than structures. And so we have some industry partnerships. We're now in a first line production of a new drug that we're going to try in humans. We test it out in animals and we build imaging systems to do that. And we do uh, first in human clinical trials. And, and Keith Paulson has done this a couple of times now and we're just next year hoping to start with a new drug uh, targeted to a receptor. And, you know, this is a rich area. It's not, uh, again, it's not a single investigator. There's actually many of us kind of layering our grants together um, with the idea that we can sort of complement each other's research. Uh, roughly, there's about five grants or so, uh, five surgical faculty, three surgical faculty, five Thayer faculty, uh, but it's changing all the time, and we have collaborations with a number of companies. Uh, now, this was, this was really started by Keith um, back in about the 2007 era where he started working with Dave Roberts in neurosurgery. And again, he's talked about this last year, so I won't, I won't belabor the point, but uh, uh, the, the idea in this clinical trial was that we get, have patients administered aminoluvalinic acid, and that happens to produce a chemical called protoporphyrin 9 in many tumors and is very upregulated in glioma tumors. And so in this case, that molecule is also fluorescent. And so you can shine blue light, whoops, shine blue light on the tissue and you see the pink fluorescence and it's a visible light. So this is sort of one generation of how could you use molecules to guide surgical resection. Uh, the, the neurosurgeon uses, has historically used structures and preclinical imaging and this is a way to use sort of the, me the metabolism of the tissue, if you will, to, to guide surgical resection. Uh, but, you know, uh, just earlier this year, I published this sort of review paper, uh, sort of thinking abstractly, if, if you could image, if you could guide surgery with anything, what would you like to guide it with? You know, there's structures. So this is sort of the four categories of physiology. There's structures. There's metabolism. Metabolism is things like enzymes, carbohydrates, minerals. There's immunology, like growth factors, receptors, cytokines, hormones. And then there's genetics, you know, DNA and RNA. And so which of these would you like to use? I think the obvious answer is, well, we'd like to use DNA, right? If you, if you want to get the most specificity you could possibly get, why not guide your surgery by DNA? Well, the reason we can't guide it by DNA is because it's at the picomolar concentration. So the concentration as you go this way is extremely low. The concentrations as you go this way are very, very high. So it's, it's really easy to guide intervention by structures because it's at sort of millimolar concentrations. Uh, it's actually very challenging as you go that way. But so, but still, most of surgery is guided by structures, right? The surgeon sees structures, they touch them, they cut them. Uh, they do pre-surgical pre imaging and they see structures in the image that, they guide, that guide their surgery. What Keith and Dave Roberts showed is that you could use metabolism. So that protoporphyrin 9 imaging um, is based on metabolism because it's, uh, it's produced in the heme synthesis pathway of, uh, of cancer cells. And so what we're pushing now is could we use immunology to guide tumor resection? The idea that receptors on cancer cells are probably as close as we might get, and yet the concentration is still detectable, let's say. Uh, in the optical fluorescence world, you know, it's actually, you can detect nanomolars of things. You, you really, it's very, very hard to detect picomolars of things, but you, you can detect nanomolar concentrations reasonably well. But of course, as you go up here, it gets easier and easier. So, so, but in the big world of 
molecular guided surgery, this is sort of the, the, big, the big picture. And if we did want to image immunology based on receptors, um, you know, what could we use? Well, there's many, many things, and the biological engineers here make these all the time, genetically engineer production of antibodies, fabs, mini bodies, tetra bodies, uh, uh, single chain fragments, uh, all the way down to little peptides. And uh, we um, struck up a partnership with a company that had been developing what's called, what they call AFABody, which is uh, really just the binding domain of the, uh, of the um, single chain binding domain of the antibody. And it looks like this sort of three helix coil. It's a 56 uh, uh, peptide sequence, which we bind, we permanently bind with a fluorophore, in this case, IR-DI 800. Uh, and so we partnered with both the companies that produce these to uh, do a, a drug production run. And we said, we'll do the clinical trial here. So this was fun because we uh, partnered with them. We convinced the NCI to give us the money. And so we have three partners, uh, Dartmouth, Lycor, who makes the fluorophore, and Afibody in Sweden, who makes the uh, Afibody. And we have two production partners, Bachem, that makes the pep physically makes the peptide, and uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, that has a GMP drug production facility. And so we produce the peptide in Germany, we ship it to Alabama, we get the dye from uh, Nebraska, we ship it to Alabama, they uh, produce the drug, they ship it up to us, and that all happened um, just this fall. And so we have this drug production schedule, and so you can see the list of people here, uh, Sally Hall, uh, uh, Jason Gunn, uh, Kayla Mara, and Kim Samko are kind of leading up this effort. So we got the drug produced, uh, we have pre preclinical um, versions of the drug, so this is sort of the test version before we go to humans. Uh, did a whole bunch of, they did a ton of work on uh, standard operating procedures where we uh, developed this so that we could prove that the drug isn't toxic. We tested it in 97 rats, sliced them up into 4,000 cassettes, and uh, did you know massive amount of work to do toxicity testing of the drug. So it's an exciting time, and we're just poised now to, to submit for FDA for submission. So this is the kind of thing again that um, you know this involves uh, easily four or five faculty, um, uh, four or five staff members, several graduate students, um, as well as external collaborations. And it's the sort of big science that we're hoping to keep on going. Um, you know, as part of this, Keith and I got involved in creating a conference because we realized actually this is, a, this is an emerging field. There, is com there are companies that produce devices. There are companies testing production of drugs. But in fact, there actually is no conference on the idea of molecular guided surgery. And so we said, well, let's, let's start a conference. And so we're, uh, we're in our second year of running it in uh, San Francisco every year uh, called Molecular Guided Surgery, Molecules, Devices, and Applications. And uh, we convinced some of the companies to, to pay for it. And uh, we uh, invite you know, surgeons and engineers to come and talk about what they're doing. So that's, uh, that's an example of the kind of um, science that I hope continues and, and that we'll see flourish. Now, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a researcher who I think drives myself to the point of neurotic uh, breakdown, trying to say, okay, what's next? That's not good enough. What's next? How can we push this forward? Because we're going to do a clinical trial, and the results, you know, will either show something or nothing, but, you know, we've got to push it to the next level. And so what's next? And so this is very much related to what we could use this new facility for. And you know the things that researchers do are we do original research, we analyze it, we organize national and international collaborations, we organize conferences, workshops, we, you know, we hopefully we shape funding decisions because funding in this country is decided by somebody and hopefully we're involved in that dialogue. And we obviously 
educate the next scientific leaders as, as the PhD and master's students and the undergrads here at Dartmouth are. Um, and so we said, well, we, need, we should do this a little more systematically. And so uh, I walked around campus with my hand out asking people for contributions. And I said, let's, let's create this Center for Imaging Medicine. And the idea isn't, it's not medical imaging, it's imaging medicine. So we do imaging, and we would like to use that in the uh, pursuit of understanding medicine. And so this is uh, uh, what the center is going to do. So let me give you one example. So here's, a, here's an example of what a center could do. So I, you know, we're, we're kind of awash in the idea of uh, how, how fundable is your work or how valuable is it. And so I, I made this little cartoon graph. So I put technological innovation on the vertical axis, right? As engineers and scientists, we care about innovation, right? So I put that on the vertical axis. But, you know, the world cares about how much is it worth, right? So, so I put commercial valuation on the y-axis, and I, I had to come up with axes. You know, being a good engineer, I always tell my students, label your axes, right? <laughs> so I labeled my axes dollars on the bottom, and just how, how bright's the light bulb on the, on the vertical axis. Right? And so, you know, most of... You know, most of what we do day to day, if I go to my group meeting, or we, most of what we wind up talking about are just stuff. You know, there's ideas, right? If, if we were at the business school, we would think this way, right? We would think laterally. Let's come up with something that's going to get us a commercial success, and the success is defined by how much money are we going to make, right? That's the business world. In the scientific world, we care about the vertical axis, right? So we want, as scientific success, we want innovation. We want to publish the most exciting results. We want to discover things. Um, and then, you know, in the engineering world, uh, this is definitely a major piece of it, right? Which is if we're serving society and we think what we're doing has a value, maybe there should be commercial success as well. Not necessarily, but maybe. And so, in fact, it doesn't have to be commercially successful. I think many of us in the, as scientists would say, look, you can have scientific success or you can have commercial and scientific success, but you can't just have commercial success, right? I, if I just made a new skateboard, that's not going to advance my engineering here at the Thayer School. But if I make a skateboard that flies, right, that's a scientific success and a commercial success. So, you know, the axis then is really kind of how do you, you know, so I, I, I'm going to erase the bottom part, right? Because the top part is all we really care about. And so, you know, how do, how do we make it work? How do, you, how do you make that stuff work? Well, you've got foundations, you've got grants, you've got corporate funding, SBIR, angel funding, venture funding. The more valuation there is, you know, the more you go to that left access towards angel and venture funding. Uh, but if you're in the scientific research world, you know, grants and foundations are, are pretty much it. Uh, so that's what I would call the axis I care about, is how to fund your research. And, you know, for each project, and I've worked on a lot of projects, each project I've worked on is somewhere along this axis. Uh, and figuring it out, figuring out where to be on that axis is actually part of the research. Because if you can't fund your research, you're not doing research. So let me, let me uh, show you an example of that, where we're actually, you know, we're, we're somewhere on that axis, and we're trying to figure out where we are. So uh, uh, about five or six years ago, we developed this idea of being able to image radiation therapy dose. And so this is an example of science and enterprise. And I'll try to go through this efficiently, but if you uh, don't know, radiation therapy is the, uh, delivered to almost 50% of all cancer patients, uh, and uh, it's delivered with high-energy electrons and photons that go through a linear accelerator and launch onto the patient. And this is just an imaging panel that comes out, and the beam is shaped uh, to different shapes to target the tumor and spare the normal tissue. Um, and so the patient lies on the table, and they're doing a mock prostate treatment here so for, for prostate cancer. 
where the multi-leaf collimators change dynamically and that radiation therapy beam um, is delivered to, through the tissue and it arcs around to different uh, angles and uh, treats the prostate cancer while trying to minimize the radiation to the normal tissue. Um, again, a pretty large fraction of men will uh, receive, get prostate cancer at some point in their life, so there you go. Well, what we discovered about six years ago was that we could image the radiation delivery. So when radiation hit tissue, it gave off little uh, spots of what's called Cherenkov light. And that uh, if you looked at it, you couldn't see it in the room light. But because the radiation is pulsed, we can actually pick it up with the right camera. So we, just, we went down this technology search pathway where we discovered that uh, you know, the right camera for us was a time-gated amplified imaging uh, CCD camera. And this is just a real-time video sort of showing you the radiation beam hitting the square and the noise flying around the room uh, right here. And, and, and so the, the signal is, you know, it's a classic electrical engineering problem. It's a really small signal with a lot of noise flying around. But the good part is the noise is predictable because it's, uh, it's salt and pepper noise and the background ambient light is uh, static. And so we gate to these Cherenkov pulses and we're able to uh, selectively pick up uh, the signal. And so technologically, what we did was we got the highest gain we could, fastest gate, did some wavelength filtering, median filtering in space and time, and background subtraction. And so we layer like all these different signal detection things together and we discovered that we could do single photon count imaging with the room lights on. And really this, is, this was like the key scientific discovery that allowed us to image radiation dose. Um, and so we, uh, in 2014, actually completed a clinical trial where we imaged women undergoing whole breast radiation. So this is a woman lying on the table, so she's had a lumpectomy. Uh, and we image them from this camera over here while they're getting radiation therapy. And so you can see the woman breathing. You can see her chest going up and down. Uh, and so it's a real-time video. And this, the room lights are gated out. So the room lights are on, but you can't see it in the picture because we've, we've gated that away. And you can see that we pick up exactly the radiation beam as it hits the tissue. And, um, you know, this, I, I, every time I talk about this, I get excited because, you know, for 100 years we've been imaging x-ray transmission through tissue. This is actually the first time in history that anybody has imaged radiation dose hitting tissue. Uh, so it, for us, it was a pretty uh, exciting event. And just to take it one step further, uh, Jacqueline Andriozzi, who's somewhere here, uh, uh, showed that uh, she could image um, radiation therapy to the whole body. And so there are a class of patients who have T-cell lymphoma, and they get uh, radiation treatment to their entire skin surface. Um, and this is a, it's a pretty rare disease, and so up here in the Upper Valley, it's fairly infrequent, but uh, they do receive whole body radiation. And uh, so she discovered in her imaging that we had been underdosing the legs of these patients. And so you can see you know, the, 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 the body these patients are red, and the lower leg area is, is a darker blue, and, and so they were, were actually underdosing the radiation to the legs for about 15 to 20 years. Um, and so uh, she presented this at the American Association of Physicists and Medicine and received the first prize Young Investigator Award. So it was very exciting and good job. Um, we have since uh, taken the camera to England, where we imaged in Birmingham the uh, CyberKnife system. This is a very complex radiation therapy that's on a robotic arm, and so it's used for very special cases of stereotactic radiosurgery. And doing dosimetry with this system is really hard, and so we showed that you could use Cherenkov imaging to predict the dose delivered at different spots on a tissue. And uh, for some reason, Hammond thought it would be a good idea to stick his head in the linear accelerator. Uh, but definitely not a good idea. Um, so 
we realized that there is a commercial opportunity here. And so this is, uh, you know, I've been involved, involved in many startup companies since I've been here. Uh, none of them have really actually done anything. This one, uh, though, is actually a real commercial opportunity because Dartmouth has patented this. And so there's some really selective IP that has no background. And so we started a company. We got two SBIR grants, and uh, we're in some finance discussions with companies and funding agencies and things. And so it's an exciting time. I, I think that uh, you know we've created a device that will uh, have a commercial value. And, and so this is, again, the sort of network that I envision that our research should, should, should strive for, which is reaching out to uh, people around the world and making sure that uh, our research works with other people or other people's research work with us. And so now we have we've have a half a dozen different locations where we've tested out Cherenkov Imaging and Dose Optics has, uh, has some uh, connections at Stanford and UPenn that we're planning to exploit. So it's an example of Dartmouth technology getting out into the world and uh, we're, we're, we're shifting on this scale from grant funding to uh, potential commercial venture. And uh, just uh, this is just kind of fun, but uh, we also showed that we could use the same idea to excite molecular probes in tissue. And so this is a rat with an oxygen sensitive dye in one lymph node. So we showed that we could uh, excite uh, molecular probes in vivo while doing radiation therapy. And then we just received a, a DOD award to, to fund that. So you know the other thing. The other so so that's one example. That's one example where a center could help because um, uh, you know actually I, I don't know how to start a business. You know I uh, I need people who know how to start businesses to help me start a business, and I think that's true for many investigators. Uh, and so what a center can do, like many centers, is just cluster the right groups of people together. So that's one one thing the center hopefully will help with. Another thing is this idea that uh, you need to figure out the right level of innovation versus collaboration, right? So here I just made another cartoon graph. So I put uh, innovation again on the x axis or y axis, and, and you know how much do you collaborate on the y axis, x axis? And so you know there still is room for the individual PI, and the individual's PI, is, their goal is to discover things, right? So if you don't collaborate with anybody, your goal is just to do really good research and make discoveries. Uh, and that's great. But you know, more and more in the NIH world or in the biomedical world, that is actually not a viable pathway. Um, in, in fact, there are uh, NIH and many granting agencies force people into collaborative endeavors. And so the question is, what type of collaborative endeavor do you envision for yourself, right? Uh, there's the sort of multi-PI common research approach, which I call sort of the, the socialist dogma of everybody does the same thing, but we just get the money together, right? uh, There's the multi-PI collaborative approach, which is, you know, I look for investigators who complement my knowledge, and we do things for each other that help each other. And then there's the sort of multi-threaded approach, which is, we're all going to do cool stuff, and uh, we might talk to each other, but it's all sort of going to happen in parallel. Any of these are OK. Well, actually, the bottom one's probably not OK. But unfortunately, many collaborations are like that. Uh, it's these upper ones you know, that are more creative. Um, and so I wanted to give you one example of uh, research I've been involved with ever since I've been here that is good science but actually has no commercial value whatsoever. <laughs> uh, and I'm still OK with that. <laughs> so it's this, uh, what we call our fluorescence dosimeter. And so here's the idea is um, patients who have skin cancer or pre-skin cancer in this country and in Europe can have uh, what's called photodynamic therapy. And so um, here's a lesion. And what happens is we put aminoluvalinic acid on the lesion for an hour or two. And then we shine light on the lesion, and it photosensitizes it. So the, 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 the drug photosensitizes it, and the light activates it. 
So it's, it's often called a light activated chemotherapy because that's really what it is, is light activating a chemotherapy. And so you can see this patient here having treatment. And so this is a classic example of actinic keratosis before treatment and actinic keratosis after treatment. And here's a basal cell carcinoma before treatment and basal cell carcinoma gone. So it works. Um, but it's used to different levels in different countries and different clinics, and, but we, we do it here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. And so this has been a long-term research uh, that I've been involved with and a, a number of others, Chad Kanick and, and uh, Yan and Scott Davis here. Um, we carried out a clinical trial, and really Chad and Yan did the bulk of this work. Uh, and Chad showed that... Um, uh, the drug actually fluoresces, and so we can measure the concentration of it in the tissue. All right, so here's the lesion. We put on the dye, and it fluoresces. So it's not rocket science. We could measure how much is there by measuring the fluorescence. And so we measured close to 80 patients, and here's the graph that we see of the concentration of the drug versus the patient number. And so you can see the, the signals all over the place. There's actually a substantial number of patients who have no drug whatsoever and a, substantial, and a number of patients who have very, very high drug levels and everything in between. And unfortunately, this is true, that there is enormous patient variability. So some patients respond and some patients don't respond. Uh, and so this has uh, been a research program we've been doing. And again, I, I've been doing this since I got here, 1996. Uh, so we started the company with Greg Burke and that went out of business. And then we restarted a company in 2005, and that actually lasted for a couple of days. <laughs> and then ever since, uh, Scott and Kim and Chad and Yan and, and a number of the others in the laboratory have been involved with this. Um, and we've gotten a lot of good data. We, we've published a lot of papers on drug uptake in mice. We've treat, we did a whole clinical trial in veterinary animals where we treated oral sarcomas in dogs and uh, showed that we could cure oral sarcomas. We've done human clinical trials. And the boxes, as we call them, we've, it would be, it's, it's surprising. Uh, the idea of measuring fluorescence is pretty straightforward. You need a laser, and you need a detector, and a fiber, potentially. And you would think that's pretty easy, but actually it's incredibly hard uh, <laughs> to make this stable and robust in particular, we now ship these to many of our collaborators at different locations in the world and make that robust so that uh, a non-expert can use it is pretty hard. So now what we do is we package Ethan with the box and we send, we send the box around. Uh, no, that's not really true. Uh, but we, we, uh, we have made a number of these boxes and we've shipped them to sites in Massachusetts, Montreal, Cleveland, we shipped one to a company in France, to University College London. We're just shipping one to Panama right now for a clinical trial, and uh, later this year we hope to make one for a group in China. So this has no commercial potential whatsoever, uh, but there's really good science. We've, we've probably gotten two million in funding on this. We've published about 16 papers, and we easily have eight sites of use. And so what the engineering school has let us do is sort of make these at cost, and we sell them to our research partners at cost. Um, but there's no commercial device that will do this in a robust manner, and certainly not a calibrated one. And so it's, a, it's an example of good science, but uh, probably not much commercial value. And, and I... I don't want to go through too many of these, but there are examples of these over and over again. We've been involved in near-infrared tomography of breast cancer. This is the latest version of the system that Xu Dong Jiang is pioneering, which uh, clamps onto a woman's breast while she's getting chemotherapy, and we image, and we can see changes in the hemoglobin uh, in the breast, which predict whether that patient will be responsive or just partially responsive to chemotherapy. Oops. So that's been exciting. Again, uh, good science, over 50 publications, $8 million in funding, national collaborative trial we've been involved with, but probably uh, not necessarily commercially viable today. Um, 
we've been involved in a pancreas cancer treatment trial uh, where we treat pancreatic cancer with photodynamic therapy. Um, I think I'll probably skip over this, but uh, just to say that uh, we discovered that through the pre and post imaging studies, actually just the preclinical imaging studies that we could predict whether the patient would respond well or not to the treatment. And so we actually have now formulated a whole phase two clinical trial just based on imaging, uh, predicting whether the patient will respond or not. And then last example, um, we have uh, for a long time been imaging um, fluorescence in animals. And uh, this is just an example from uh, Alicia D'Souza's work showing that we can image uh, lymphatic tracking of fluorescent drugs. And we've been doing some contract research for Immunext showing uh, that we can image where drugs go and look at the uptake in, in different parts of the mouse anatomy. So again, a, a viable commercial interest, but basic science. So that's really uh, what I wanted to go over. The, the center is going to be about imaging science. It's going to be about having an impact in medicine, looking for innovations in imaging, looking for collaborations, uh, looking for education opportunities, looking for leadership so that Dartmouth investigators reach leadership roles in the country and nationally, uh, and looking for enterprise opportunities. And so we've, uh, we're, in the, we're at the cusp of submitting a NIH P41 application, which would fund the center. Uh, right now, we have some pilot funding that we're operating on. And the idea is uh, really, uh, for now, again, this is where we get into the grantsmanship of it. Uh, the center can help many investigators many different ways. But for the purposes of a grant, we have to focus. And so our, our current focus is low light, solving problems in low light level imaging in medicine, uh, solving problems in multi-scale sensing, meaning you know, are you imaging structures, metabolism, immunology, or DNA? And then solving problems in interventional guidance, because we really have this world-class research facility here. Uh, where we can do imaging and surgery in the same setting, and that's extremely unusual. And then uh, what Dartmouth is also very good at is training and dissemination. So we have, we're uh, going to set up a number of uh, training courses, annual workshops, um, and uh, um, opportunities that way. So uh, we have uh, a website, so we're actually real. <laughs> it's not live yet. It's going to be hopefully live on Monday. We'll see. Uh, we are currently sponsoring two workshops, and that, that means giving out cash to workshops where Dartmouth technology or Dartmouth uh, faculty are taking a lead role in organizing the workshop. And that's, again, if, if there are investigators here who do biomedical imaging, um, I'm looking for ways to use that money to help you fund workshops or somehow getting your vision of biomedical technology out into the world. So that's, that's what we're hoping to do in the immediate future. So that's what I wanted to cover. And you know, just as a sort of a closing thought, um, you know, this is the Thayer School of Engineering on the top. And, uh, but you know, when you think of the Thayer School of Engineering, you think of this building. But you know, more and more, uh, many of our faculty and graduate students are going to be in the Vail and Remsen Research Building and then on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, both of which have great parking. <laughs> so I don't know if Joe's here or not. I put that up for him. But uh, uh, it's a great opportunity. So uh, if you're looking for a, a safe engineering spot to have a cup of coffee, come up to the seventh floor of the Williamson Building. It's Thayer, Thayer School of Engineering. Thank you. Is it? Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, or we can all have a yogurt. Have a sure. Yeah. As you uh, commercialize the technology, there's a tendency, there's pressure in the commercial realm to keep things quiet. Right. That kind of is 180 degrees off from the academic. Enterprise, which emphasizes publishing early, publishing before your competition, getting all the facts out there. Yeah. So, so how do you balance that as you move something into the commercial realm? 
Yeah, that's a great question, and I mean, obviously, that's a whole that's a whole symposium to answer that. Uh, but um, you know, every I would say every investigator and every commercial venture I've ever been involved with has a different answer to that. You know, some are, as you said, some are very extremely secretive, don't want to publish anything. Others are extremely open. Uh, you know, as a as a researcher myself, I'm completely open, uh, and I'm. I'm, I weigh on the side of publishing everything as much as possible and patenting things when appropriate, right? So as long as you, you know, and this is the mantra of tech transfer here, as long as you put in your patent disclosure and they have the opportunity to do provisional patent, that shouldn't stop you from publishing. And I, I think for most people in this environment, that's the right answer. Uh, if a company like, is, you know, like Google or, or Apple is doing something where there's super competition, obviously secrecy is much more important. But I don't think most of the things we work on is at that level are at that level. They're, most of the things we work on, publication actually helps the technology. So in the radiation, so a good example is in the radiation imaging world. You know, us publishing actually helps the company because it's kind of this bizarre little technology nobody's heard of. And so it were, there's sort of a credi credibility gap in some ways, and so publishing uh, helps. So, good question. Other answers? Yep? Is your um, fluorescence dissimetry sensor absorbency sensing? Uh, yeah, Chad could talk to you for a whole hour about that, or <laughs> a whole day about that. But, but basically, yes. Yeah, you can do absorption based measurements or fluorescence based measurements for sure. And you know, the, in the optical spectroscopy world, I think a good rule of thumb is fluorescence is about 10 times more sensitive than absorption. So. Yeah? Right, so that, that's actually the drug we're producing now. It will, I, I think I didn't explain that properly, but it binds to the epidermal growth factor receptor. Uh -huh. So the new drug uh, will be receptor-based targeting, and it's a little uh, peptide, again, that binds to that receptor on the external surface of the cells. Um, so that's, I, you know, that's, uh, scientifically, that's sort of our next frontier. That's what we're trying to push towards, because I think most people believe the specificity of that would be high. Um, also, you know, the can in the cancer therapy world, you know, and much of what's going on is receptor-based targeting. And so for therapy, and so if you believe receptor-based targeting for therapy works, that's a whole subject of discussion, um, receptor-based targeting for imaging should work as well. So that's, that's a reference. Okay, well, thank you everyone. <laughs>